This week, the Curia comes together to set a date for Mother Teresa's canonization. The Ukrainian Catholic Church reaffirms its communion with Rome, and Pope Francis shares his prayer intentions for this month. Hello and welcome to this edition of Vatican Connections. Now, we've been on pilgrimage for the last little while, so we've got a lot to catch up on. Let's take a look. Pope Francis has released his prayer intentions for the month of March. To tell us what he's praying for, here's Pope Francis himself. La familia es uno de los bienes más preciosos de la humanidad, pero acaso no es el más vulnerable? Cuando la familia no es protegida y empiezan las dificultades, tipo económico, el tipo de salud, de cualquier tipo, los chicos crecen en cierta atmósfera de tristeza. Quiero compartir con vos, con Jesús, mi intención del mes, para que las familias en dificultad reciban los apoyos necesarios y los niños puedan crecer en ambientes sanos y serenos. The date for Mother Teresa's canonization will be set next week. The Vatican announced an ordinary public consistory, that's a meeting of cardinals, to decide on the canonization of several blesseds. During that consistory, the Pope and the cardinals will set the date not only for the canonization of Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, they will also set the canonization date for the Argentine Blessed Jose Gabriel Brochero, as well, uh, who is known as the Gaucho Priest, as well as Blessed Jose Sanchez, who was a young Cristero in Mexico, and Mary Hasselbad, who established a branch of the Brigitine Order in Sweden. Now, last week, Cardinal George Pell gave testimony to an Australian Royal Commission looking into how the Church dealt with abuse allegations. The Cardinal gave 20 hours of testimony and answered questions from 11 different lawyers. Some of the questions referred to alleged conversations that took place 30 to 40 years ago. Cardinal Pell answered everything, even if in some cases it meant explaining why the alleged conversation could not have taken place. For example, in two of those instances, anonymous witnesses claimed to have spoken to or heard then Father Pell talking to others about alleged abuse. Now, after giving testimony, Cardinal Pell met with a group of abuse survivors who had traveled from Australia to see him testify. Here's what the Cardinal had to say after that meeting. Okay. Uh, I, I've just met with uh, about a dozen of the Ballarat survivors, uh, support people and officials. And I've heard each of their stories and of their suffering. It was hard. An honest and occasionally, occasionally emotional meeting. I'm committed to working with these people from Ballarat and surrounding areas. I know many of their families and I know of the goodness of so many people in Catholic Ballarat, a goodness which is not extinguished by the evil that was done. We all want to try to make things better actually and on the ground especially for the survivors and their families and I undertake to continue to help the group work effectively with the committees 
and agencies that we have here in the church in, in Rome, and especially the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors. One suicide is too many, too many. And there have been many such tragic suicides. I commit myself to working with the group to strive to stop this so that suicide is not seen as an option for those who are suffering. I too, despite the separation of distance, want to make, uh, help make Ballarat a model and a better place of healing, for healing and for peace. Now I shouldn't promise what might be impossible. Uh, we all know how hard it is uh, to get things done. But uh, I do want it known that I support the work to investigate the feasibility of a research uh, centre to enhance healing and to improve uh, protection. The church-going people of the Ballarat Diocese are known for their loyalty and for their charity. And I urge them to continue to cooperate with the survivors to improve the situation. I owe a lot to the people and community of Ballarat. I acknowledge that with deep gratitude. It would be marvellous if our city became well known as an effective centre and the example of practical help for all those wounded by the scourge of sexual abuse. Thank you. Depending on who you ask, Pope Pius XII is either the Pope who acted silently and heroically to save Jews during the Second World War, or he's the Pope who failed to act publicly to stand up to Hitler. A new book just released claims that Pius XII actually worked secretly to overthrow Hitler three times. CNS has more. The thing about Pius XII, most people who've heard about him today think about him perhaps as, well, wasn't he the Pope who was silent on the Shoah and didn't speak out? Or wasn't he the one who was Hitler's Pope or something like that? But, and that's part of the story that we've, we've been told. But there's another part of the story which hasn't been told, which has remained underground for about uh, seven decades. And that is how Pius XII conspired with the German resistance to try and get rid of Hitler on not just one, but three occasions from 1939 to 1945. Rather than just consider what he did not say, about which billions of words have been published in, in, in English alone, I thought, why not just look at what he actually did, even if it's in secret? And that took me many, many years to piece together. For instance, we have um, Pius's letters to the German bishops during the war, where he, uh, he says, please, please do more of, of what uh, Father Lichtenberg did when he prayed for the Jews and was arrested and sent off to Dachau and died. The Holy Father said, that's exactly the kind of manly actions which I'm hoping German Catholics will undertake. We've forgotten what it's like to live directly in the face of radical evil, such as happened in, in Nazi Germany, World War II. And the choices that were then made by Catholics, um, some Jesuit priests who went to the gallows for their um, complicity in plots to remove Hitler, the adventures of Josef Mueller, this ace of papal spies, a German lay agent, and the courage shown by the Holy Father, Pope Pius XII himself, are great ways of reminding us the heroism that human beings are capable of. On March 5th, Pope Francis met with the Synod members of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Their meeting marked the 70th anniversary of the Pseudo-Synod of Lviv. 
In 1946, the Soviet government organized a synod of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in order to dissolve it and make it part of the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, to mark the anniversary, the leaders of the Ukrainian Catholic Church met with Pope Francis for over an hour at the Vatican. They reaffirmed their communion with Rome. Pope Francis also released a statement in which he remembered the Ukrainian Catholics who suffered because they refused to give up their fidelity to the Pope. Finally, it's hard to believe that Holy Week is just around the corner. We have details this week about the traditional Good Friday Stations of the Cross that take place at the Colosseum every year. The texts of the meditations were written by Cardinal Gualtiero Bassetti of Perugia. The Cardinal told Vatican Radio his inspiration was a painting by Il Perugino that shows the connection between the Passion of Christ and the Passion of Humanity. As a result, his meditations mention the different places in the world where people experience pain, like in war or in poverty. Another recurring theme is the family and Christians suffering persecution. Now, Salt and Light will bring you live coverage of the Stations of the Cross from Rome on Good Friday, so stay tuned for more details. Over the past year or so, unprecedented numbers of people from Syria, the Middle East, and Africa have fled their homelands to Europe in search of safety. Although Pope Francis has called on parishes to take in at least one migrant family, the response has been mixed. Catholic News Service explores the flood of migration to Europe, the response to it, and the Pope's call to open doors. La mia preghiera e anche la vostra ha sempre presente il dramma dei profughi che fuggono dalle, da, da guerre e altre situazioni disumane, in particolare la Grecia e gli altri paesi che sono in prima linea stanno prestando a essi un generoso soccorso che necessita della collaborazione di tutte le nazioni. In a crisis situation, it requires um, extraordinary generosity and uh, effort uh, to come to uh, terms with the dire situation in which many, many people uh, find, find themselves. Um, also, I, I, I believe that it is necessary for uh, Europe uh, to face up to these uh, problems together and to find common solutions so that Europe will indeed maintain its strength and even become stronger through, through these trials and difficulties. At the moment in Europe we have, across Europe, the rise of nationalist parties which have strong anti-immigration agendas and which are really a protest against uh, globalisation. Uh, uh, and there's no doubt that many people feel deeply disconcerted uh, by contemporary globalisation because it's resulted in huge displacement of peoples um, and change, very rapid change, which of course is always difficult for people uh, to assimilate. Ce qui est sûr, c'est que la mondialisation réduit la diversité humaine. Plus on voyage dans le monde, plus on découvre les mêmes constructions, la même architecture, les mêmes spectacles, les mêmes chansons, les mêmes films, etc. J'ai appelé euh, cette, euh, du nom de « idéologie du même » l'ensemble des doctrines religieuses ou profanes qui considèrent que Ce qu'il y a de commun et d'identique chez tous les hommes est beaucoup plus important que les différences individuelles 
ou collective et qui s'efforce de réduire ces différences, de les faire disparaître dans l'espoir d'arriver à un monde plus unifié, donc plus homogène. People have talked about the clash of civilizations and those parties are really those who really support that, that viewpoint. Um, so there are talks of course about a sort of a, a real or imaginary European identity, Christian identity for some of them. Now today uh, I would say the, the sort of the chief target uh, is Islam. Islam being seen by those parties as, as, a, as a major issue. The right-wing populists, in part, have been very clever. Um, they've moved from um, a criticism that was a criticism um, that was rooted in race and racism to a much more culturally savvy form of criticism. The line is, uh, we have nothing against uh, Muslims. We have a problem with radical Islam that prevents us from upholding our liberal values and our social values that are deeply European. So the, the right-wing populists are coming across as, you know, the progressive defenders of a more enlightened religion, but also of simply of a more a kind of accommodating liberal social order. really simple xenophobia is being justified or rationalized in terms of this concept of laicity of their secularism but the the intellectual basis of that is so feeble and so self-contradictory that it's really what's plainly removing people is straight old we feel uncomfortable with these other people here what are they doing here and are they going to ruin our way of life If we start dismissing every uh, party which affirms the na national identity against the international order, if we start dismissing it as populist, we are in effect dismissing what ordinary people want. The correct response for Europe, as for uh, all the nations of Europe, is to say, look, people are not happy without boundaries. They need them in order to feel secure in their territory, in order to know what it is they are, where they are going, and who they belong to, and what law uh, they should be obeying. Our identity has to be reconstructed on the basis that who is here? Who is here that has to live together? And that has to be the basis of it. And there's an ethical drive to, if you like, redefine the national identity and go on redefining it in each successive epoch. The parties, I suppose one might call the liberal and more left-wing parties in Europe, which are very worried by the rise of the right-wing anti-immigrant parties, are going to find in the church a strong ally because the church is a vigorous exponent and defender uh, of the rights of migrants. The Pope's also very big on what he calls the culture of encounter, which is about, uh, in a modern pluralist society, uh, how you can uh, develop an understanding of the common good out of lots of different narratives. Uh, but if, to do that, you have to be able to sit together, to understand each other, to listen to each other. Let's take a look now at what Pope Francis has been doing this past week. On Sunday, Pope Francis led the Angelus as usual, but this time the Angelus came on the heels of a tragedy in Yemen. CNS has more. Esprimo la mia vicinanza alle missionarie della carità per il grave lutto che le ha colpite due giorni fa con l'uccisione di quattro religiose ad Aden nello Yemen dove assistevano gli anziani 
Prego per loro e per le altre persone uccise nell'attacco e per i familiari. Questi sono i martiri di oggi. E questi non sono copertina dei giornali, non sono notizie. Questi danno il suo sangue per la Chiesa. Questi sono vittime dell'attacco di quelli che li hanno uccisi e anche dell'indifferenza, di questa globalizzazione dell'indifferenza, che non importa. Madre Teresa accompagna in Paradiso queste sue figlie martiri della carità, e interceda per la pace e il sacro rispetto della vita umana. The rest of the week was very quiet because the Pope and the members of the Curia were out of town for spiritual exercises. Vatican Television has more. Pope Francis and members of the Roman Curia this weekend began their Lenten spiritual exercises retreat in Ariccia. They arrived Sunday afternoon at the Casa del Maestro for the retreat, which will last until Friday. This year's retreat is being led by Father Hermes Ronchi, a priest of the Servite Order, and centers on ten key questions from the Gospel. After reciting the Angelus in St. Peter's Square on Sunday, Pope Francis asked the faithful to pray for him and all those taking part in the retreat. All activities are suspended during the five-day retreat, including the Wednesday general audience. On Saturday, Pope Francis is scheduled to hold a weekend general audience. This is one of his special extra audiences for the Jubilee year. Let's take a look now at the resignations and nominations that happened this week. The former rector of the Pontifical North American College in Rome has been named a bishop. Monsignor James Kekio will become Bishop of Mechican, New Jersey. Now, he's originally from Camden and was ordained in 1992. He has served in a number of different roles, including pastor, defender of the bond in Camden's tribunal, director of communication and public relations, and a moderator of the Curia. His term as rector of the North American College ended just a few weeks ago. Now, he's not the first former NAC director to be made a bishop. Cardinal Timothy Dolan was also rector of the North American College before being made a bishop. Well, that's all for this edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time for more of what's happening in Rome. Until then, you can follow us on Twitter or check our blog for regular updates. Now, we're going to leave you this week with some photos from our recent pilgrimage to the Holy Land. We were very blessed to have several members of our staff along with several of our regular viewers on this trip. Here's a look at some of the places we visited. From everyone here, thanks for watching. See you next time. Mm -hmm.